Welcome to the very first episode of the Soundtrack to Success podcast. Now this is a really cool episode for me because this guest is someone who I've been a fan of for quite a while. If you don't already know who Ian Martin Allison is, he is, in my opinion, one of the icons in the bass community. He has not only worked within the industry as a session and touring musician, but he has also managed to make a name for himself in the online space. He is predominantly known for being a content creator and the CXO of Scott's Bass Lessons. And if I do say so myself, we have managed to create a really cool, interesting, advice-filled episode so I really hope you all enjoy it. Just before we go into it I do want to say a massive thank you to Rode for sending me the products that have made creating and editing this podcast possible. I'm extremely grateful and I cannot wait to get filming more episodes and yeah I really hope you enjoy this one. I had a great time and Ian is a really cool guy so yeah. Again I'm trying my hardest not to make it super formal and and weird. Well not that it is it's not it's normal, not but. going to be it's going to be great i mean i want it to is. i'm gonna i'm a, i actually want to start and ask you a question can i ask <laughs> you can i can i come out of the gate and ask you a question of course you can i'm not really great on on the spot but i'll try <laughs> what made you what made you want to do a podcast so <laughs> there's a bit of a background to this i've always loved creating content and i i when i was 14 i created a youtube channel and it's that really cringe thing of oh i want to be a youtuber course, at yes. 14 years old right, right. amazing is <laughs> yeah. it still up do you does is the channel still like alive the channel's still there but the videos are privated so normal people that's a weird phrase to use but people wouldn't be able to see it yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i i have them privated so i can go back and watch them um but yeah it, since i was 14 i just love creating videos and talking to the camera which is really weird for an introvert i guess it makes sense mm-hmm. and also doesn't because introverts normally like to talk to themselves so mm-hmm. <laughs> talking to a camera makes a lot of sense i've never thought of that Yes, but it but it's true. I mean, I have some really introverted friends. I would, I don't know. I I think I would characterize myself as an extrovert, but I love yeah. a lot of introverts that feel that when they present, they can do it no problem. And maybe it's because, yeah, th- there's no one else around, <laughs> right? Like yeah. talk to camera, it's just them and a camera, and it doesn't feel like you have to hold court in a room or like beg for attention of a room because there there's no room full of people yeah I mean I don't know if other introverts would agree with me but it's in my opinion so much more less intimidating Mm. in a weird way talking to a camera than it is to an actual person yes because when you're talking to a camera there's nobody else there like for some reason I have a tendency to feel judged and to feel like I don't know this this weird thing of oh I need to impress this person sure. whereas if it's a camera it's just like although there'll be people viewing it I don't know I'll have to ask my other introvert friends and see what they say but for me it's like a switch I'm, I would definitely describe my personality as introverted but in situations like this and things that I'm passionate about the switch goes off and I'm like yeah. I can be extroverted yeah so and to do a podcast you have to be a little bit extroverted right I mean or at least you have to you have to step into those shoes a bit because you're dealing with yeah. like every guest is a different vibe and personality. And, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, well, this is the beginning of a really cool journey. The thing, the reason I asked you that is because I, mm-hmm. when I see your stuff, you have a very, you seem super comfortable in front of the camera and it's Good. rare. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And it's, <laughs> I think it's really rare to find somebody who can like, play the hell out of their instrument and also speak and speak to camera and like present. It's just, I don't know. I think it's rare. It's more rare than I thought it was. So yeah. So you're rocking it. So I'm glad you're doing the podcast. It's awesome. It, it means a lot. And I'm so, so happy that, that you're on this. Honestly, I can't even, I like, I've been such a fan of you for a long time and going into this podcast, I was like, normally you'd, you'd do the research and I have, I have done some research, but because I've known of you, I kind of felt like I already had questions in my head of like what I wanted to ask you and things I wanted to know. Um, but naturally, cause this is a professional podcast or at least we're trying to make it one. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I, Very professional, yeah. yes. <laughs> I did, I did go and do a bit of research. So I, I went on this website and they wrote a bio about you and, um, 
in this bio it said, I don't, you'll have to tell me if this mm. is true, that your first ever email address was bases are totally awesome at AOL.com. <laughs> is that right? It is right. It is right. And, and that's so, that's so cool. <laughs> I, so I'm 44. And so I'm part of the generation that grew up without the internet as a kid. And then the mm-hmm. internet happened for me. Like it was actually a real tangible thing where you get an email address when I was in like a junior or senior in high school. And I seriously thought that it was a fad. You know, I was like, oh, email, yeah. like email, oh, e electronic. I'm like, that's so dumb. Like, I remember thinking it was the dumbest thing. And I was like, oh, like I could have had Ian Allison, Ian Martin Allison, whatever, at anything.com. <laughs> I could have just had Ian at, <laughs> at whatever.com. That's you know so what I mean? It was so early. Yeah. But no usernames were taken, I feel like. And I chose, like I decided to choose <laughs> Bases are totally awesome and not, and not even like base is awesome, but bases are totally bases. awesome. There was yeah. a, I told it to somebody once when I realized, cause I used it for a while and even professionally, mm-hmm. which was such a mistake, like in my twenties, <laughs> I would use it and I'll never forget. There was a band That's leader so and an excellent drummer who was like, what's your email? And I told him and he was like, what? Mm-hmm. And he had a pen and paper and he was like, what? And I said, it's bases are totally awesome. And I was like, B, A, and he started to, to write it. it. Out. Yes. And, and he started to write it. And then out of my peripheral, I caught him pretending to finish it, but he wasn't writing. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, no. Yeah, yes. Yes. And it was at that moment I was like, oh, I have made a terrible mistake choosing to like give this email address out. So it was, you know, Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So don't, don't do that. Everybody. It's a bad idea. It's memorable. At least (laughs) I think I'd, if, if, if I was him, I'd want to be your friend after that. Yeah. (laughs) He was not feeling, (laughs) he did not feel the sort of like uh, the, the cheeky, like base nerdery vibe that I was going for. He was like, all right, man, no, I'm not writing that down. (laughs) It's, it's fine. He wasn't on your level. That's, Ian. that's right. That's right. It's, it's lost. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, what is it about bass? Cause I think I read that it's always just been bass for you yeah. and it was just no coincidence, like bass. Yes. Um, okay. So uh, I've told this story a couple times, but I have to tell you because it's, it is my origin story. Uh, mm-hmm. I was like a really tall kid. I I'm, I'm six, three. I think I was six feet tall or even over in the seventh grade. So I was really tall early and I was on a basketball team, but not because I was good at basketball. It was because mm-hmm. I was just tall. Right. Yeah. And so in the seventh grade, I'm awkward and I'm super tall and I'm kind of starting to get into music. So I have kind of longish hair and I would wear like sometimes I would wear like chains or like I was kind of like a rock kid, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, yeah. but I wasn't playing anything. I would just aesthetically. That's what I was drawn to. But I was on this basketball team and I will never forget my my cool uncle was in town. My mom and dad, my little sister were all in the stands. And like, I got the ball, you know, so I'm playing basketball and I get the ball, which was rare. I was bad at it. And I saw the hoop <laughs> and I was like, amazing. And I took a shot and I missed, but I got the rebound. I'm like, oh, damn, sick. Oh. Like I got, I'm, I'm going to get to take a second shot. And the crowd was like, yeah you know, freaking out. I'm like, this is amazing. And I take a second shot and it bricks again. And I, and then like, oh my. I get that rebound, but it was sort of like easy to get it. And I was like, oh, mm-hmm. and I was like, I guess I can take it. And the crowd is screaming. I guess I can take a third. And I took a third shot. I missed three times. And then a guy oh from the goodness. other team grabbed the ball and like laid it up and then patted me on the shoulder and said, Hey, thanks. And I realized this whole time I was shooting at the wrong basket. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and, and Layla, I looked up <laughs> it, to the to the stands, you know, and all of my family, they literally are doing this. They have their heads oh my covered goodness. in shame. And and my team was furious and rightfully so. I shot at the That is hilarious. And I didn't make a single one of the baskets. So afterwards I said, I can't do this anymore to my mother, mm-hmm. you know, who was like well, you have to do something and it can't be, it can't just be video games. And so, yeah. you know, I had a, an uncle and a cousin. I have an uncle and a cousin that were both bass players. So I kind of had a little bit mm-hmm. of that in the family. 
I was like, could we rent a base? And she was like, yeah, yeah, we could try that. And I discovered identity through it. I mean, honestly, it was the, it was the thing that I was so bad at sports. I, I was an awkward kid. And it was like, this is the thing that gave me identity, some kind of horsepower, yeah. something. So yeah, it was because of, I was absolute crap <laughs> at sports. <laughs> That's really funny though. And the universe definitely didn't was was on your side there. Three chances and you still <laughs> didn't chances. score. And Three it, chances. I mean, I wish that I just would have at least hit one of it, even though it was the wrong basket, I at least <laughs> wish I would have hit one of those shots. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. That sounds like it would have been so much worse for you. It's but a actually, nightmare either way. Yeah, nightmare. I think Dad, you can't win. You can't win there. <laughs> it is a zero sum game. Yeah. It is a pathetic endeavor no matter what the outcome. <laughs> Oh God! So yeah, God, that I'm is hilarious. Happy I found the base. Yeah, what was yeah, it for mine, you? Did you play yeah. guitar first? <laughs> yeah. So this is this is a bit of a weird one. So I actually on my thirteenth birthday, I really wanted to to start learning playing an instrument, mm-hmm. and um, my first was the drums. I was like infatuated oh, with drums, so and the, awesome. the reason was be- yeah, the reason was because I've got vivid memories of my dad. He's got really good rhythm. He's not a musician of by any means but he's got great uh rhythm and we yeah. have this like little african drum i think it might still be in the loft but i have vivid memories of us going on our caravan holiday and him with this african drum and i was just in awe of it and i loved it i was just just so loved cool. rhythm oh, yeah love it. but it, he said no to me to the drum kit because it's loud and obnoxious and yes. takes up too much space yes it does so then yeah it does it really does so then it <laughs> then it was guitar by 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 no, not much choice. It was guitar. And then in the lockdown of 2020, I found the perfect balance between the two. I was like, well, bass is a string instrument and I can be all rhythmic. Like, yes. great. It is. It's the perfect combo between the, the drums and the guitar. I had a similar, I left that out of my story, but I had a similar thing. I really wanted to play the drums. Yeah. I loved the drums. And my parents said, ah, we lived in this little town in Montana, you know, little house, no dice like fast forward in my life when I had kids, I was like, I'm getting them a drum kit. I am going to get them. I'm going to be a cool <laughs> dad that gets them the drum yeah. kit. And they could not care less. <laughs> They're like, what, your uh, kids can't, no. your kids don't care less. No, they, they couldn't care any less about the drums. Like oh. I set the drums up and they were like, cool. And they're like, bam, bang, bang. And then over, I think it has to come from you, you know, like it has to it, come yeah. from a place. Yeah. We're like, it's you funny you say it. that. Cause that, that was one of my questions later on because I, I, I wanted to talk about like what it's like having a family as a musician because mm. I obviously mm. I want I want that to be obviously on the cards in future you mm. know husband kids all of that yes um so I, I wanted to ask you kind of what that's like and one of the questions was you know are your kids do they show any interest in wanting to be a cool musician like their dad or <laughs> they they do my daughter who's 11 um she mm-hmm. is uh, she has a complicated relationship with music because it's like i'm trying to raise them to not want to be just like you know, like my wife and i are trying to raise them to have their own thing and to like things that they, and to encourage them in ways like they don't have to just be little mini versions of me. But so my daughter, you know, she started to play the cello and then she was like, maybe I'll play upright bass. And I was like, Oh, and she's like, don't, it's not the electric bass. It's different (laughs) than you. And I was like, okay. So, you know, my kids, it's, it's interesting. They're more, interested in my YouTube stuff. So doing YouTube stuff for Scott's bass lessons, because both of them, Mm. like you at 14, both of them are Mm -hmm. convinced that they want to be YouTubers, you know? Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. They couldn't care less about like, oh, the bass and pedals. And, you know, I will make them, I'll be like, check out this video because I just show Mm -hmm. them the funny stuff and they'll, and they'll watch it to, to placate me, but they are interested in the YouTube thing. I would say, One thing that I do with them on YouTube that I think is, I love doing it is whenever I get a super mean comment, I will show it to them and I'll read it to them. No way. Yeah. Because I want to, I don't want to shelter them from the reality that is like, if you want to be online, it's a minefield. Mm -hmm. I know you know that. 
And yeah, right. Like I want to have them have a healthy relationship with it. So whenever I get, I've just decided to flip it. So instead of like, you guys, this video got X amount of likes and like, Oh, and someone said I was cool. Instead of that, I am like, Mm -hmm. you guys, we celebrate the negative comments. I'm like, you guys, I got a super mean one. And they're like, what (laughs) does it say? (laughs) You know? Yeah. And I mean. No, I'm. Yeah. I'm so, I'm so happy. I'm so happy that you do that. And you, you, obviously I don't have kids, but like, I'd want to do it in the same way because the internet is no joke. Like the stuff on here is forever. Like it's forever. Especially when, when, when you're a kid, I mean, I'd want to have my kids off the internet as much as possible just because like we don't even know the extent of who's watching certain things even as a 21 year old woman now I think about it daily I'm like yes it's so great that I've built this platform but it's also incredibly scary because the internet is the internet and there's so many things that we still don't know about it so I think that's really cool that you're that you're also saying to your kids like YouTube's great and creating videos is great, but you also have like this side and yes. you can laugh about it and joke about it. But at the end of the day, like it's the reality. And I love that you're yeah, kind of teaching I, them that. I, I think like my mom raised me without a lot of taboos. She taught me about mm-hmm. drugs and sex like early. I mean, not too early, but, it, but I was one of the kids that sort of, I felt like I knew about stuff and knew about the world maybe sooner than some of my other sort of sheltered friends. And to me, it felt actually like power and not like, Oh, now I know about weed. So like, it never felt deviant. Like my mom Mm -hmm. was like, Oh, we're at a concert, you know, and I was 10 and she was like, Oh, that thing there's like a, there's like drugs that are being passed around. She's like, that's called marijuana and it's illegal (laughs) and you shouldn't do it. But at concerts, people do. And I was like, oh, okay. And she said, and I'm going to show you how to deal with it. And I said, okay. And this joint like came down the row and I was 10 and she, and someone like handed it to her and she was like, oh, thanks. And, and then just passed it along, like passed me. And she was like, Mm -hmm. she's like, here's the deal. Like it's, it's a nice gesture. And so you, you say, thank you for the gesture. It's actually a really nice thing to be offered. So you say thank mm-hmm. you, but no thank you. And then you just pass it along and that's how you deal with it. And I was like, cool. And so I just thought that everybody's parents were like my mom. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's just no, like, they're definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think so. The things that feel really like taboo, I just want to talk to my kids about. And yeah, we, mm-hmm. we decide on responses for negative comments together. So I'll say like, there was one, I, I was even going to read it to you. It, it would take too long to pull it up, but it was, I got one that was like a long, like, I hate your face. Like I hate oh your energy goodness. on every platform. You annoy me more than any. I mean, it was really intense. <laughs> and so then, you know, I brought it to my kids and I said, how yeah. do you, how do you engage with this? There's sort of three options. You can be, you can try to win and punch back. You can, Mm -hmm. you can try to go high road and say, and, and like neutralize it and, and say like, Hey, cheers, or you can ignore. And then, so whenever that happens, we decide like what, what to do. Yeah. Depending on the context. Depending on the context. Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes I think hate gets misconstrued for criticism. Sometimes if people Mm -hmm. say to, on my videos, Oh, actually it's not that it's this. I think insecurity in me can sometimes feel like, oh, oh, there that's a hater. But it's not. Yeah. Actually, it's someone that just wants my content to be better. Maybe it's maybe yeah. it's even the op you know, it's the opposite of a hater. <laughs> it's someone that really wants me to do my best. But when someone is just yeah, like straight mean, I then I'm I'm like, ah, I I try either not to engage or just to at least like I had one experience where I went into somebody's profile and said, found something that I liked of theirs. Mm-hmm. They made, they made some snarky comment and I found something that I liked and I said, I get it. I, if I annoy myself sometimes as well, Hey, the ghost notes you posted on April 11 are super solid and killing. And then he wrote me back and was like, dude, thank you. And I'm so sorry. That's the way to do it. it <laughs> yeah. It, Honestly, it, it will make them feel incredibly horrible. Like with my hate comments, I don't get a lot, thankfully. Mm-hmm. But I'm, I try to take the high road and ignore them. And I will press the block button if necessary. Yes. 
Um, but uh, there have been times where my reply is literally like, this is really sad. <laughs> like, my response to them is like, it's really sad. That, in, in a nice way. But I, I, I don't think I'm going to do that anymore. I'd rather, I like your technique. I think that's really cool. Yeah. You just point out something that you like and then that makes them feel absolutely horrible. I mean... And and I will say now I'm coming to this from the context of a 44 year old white American male. So I mm-hmm. get that my experience is going to be different than yours is going like I was trying to I was talking about this with my sister. My sister is a stunt woman in New York and oh, she wow. posts stuff and she gets the creepiest like she posted something where she was looking amazing and doing this amazing stunt. And I saw the creepers come out. Like yeah. in real time, I was like, oh, and she, she was like, see, she's like, see, big brother, this is what it's I deal real. with. You don't deal with this. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's true. I don't. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but yeah, I, I have had the experience of turning something actually into not a friendship, but at least a, a nice interaction, like where someone mm-hmm. has said something mean and I've commented, I was like, I, I get it. It's all good. You can feel that way. I actually think like what you're doing is actually really hip and having that person say, I'm so sorry. Like I had a guy say my mom had COVID. I mean, he just gave me the whole story, right? Wow. He was like, I'm sorry. I'm jealous. I'm, I'm in a bad oh place. Goodness. And and now we DM like now we're homies. Wow. And that's, that's a pretty fun, cool, actually. yeah. But I, but I also know that like, that's not necessarily going to be everybody's experience. No. I just think like what you what you said um, that you that you feel like it's sad. I agree. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of times people um, comment negatively out of jealousy. They wish they were doing what you were doing. They wish they liked making content. They wish they had started a YouTube channel when they were fourteen. You know, yeah. and yeah. they didn't. And they're ugh, and you're you're getting all these ah, uh, you know, and they want to just take a swipe. And it's sometimes yeah. it's even just for attention, just so that you'll notice them. That's so sad. It's so true. It's yeah. it's exactly what it is. I've, a lot of what I've been getting recently will be from older men who oh, aren't yeah. who don't understand the social media, the way that social media works now. And in t- it comes across as if they're they're a little bit resentful because the opportunities that I've been given as someone who's self taught, as someone who like hasn't you know, had much industry experience, I've been given this opportunity because of social media. Yes. And they like to point that out as, you know, you're not a real musician. Mm. You don't know what you're talking about. All of that, which I can I can understand their point, but they, they, they're really resistant to opening the possibilities of, okay, things are changing now. Social media exists. This has given me an incredible opportunity. The way that you used to see a musician is now changing. So, yeah, just I get so many comments now of it tends to be older men who just don't understand the social media game. And it it comes across as if they're a little bit resentful. I don't know. I don't put words in their mouth, but let me let me just verify that they are (laughs) resentful and they Mm -hmm, also don't they they don't get it. They think it's too late for them and they're Mm -hmm. furious And here's the thing. If you sucked or if they didn't think you were good, they wouldn't comment. That's the thing is it's it's the combination of their own resentment and the fact that you're killing. And they're like, yeah, it's like that's the thing that makes people furious. And I mean, even to a to a lesser extent, because I'm way older and. Mm-hmm. And, you know, was around doing gigs and things. But I have become known now as sort of like an Internet bass player, which is hilarious because I you was, have, touring yeah. and, you know, doing all this stuff before that. But I just saw the opportunity like you did. I saw the land mm-hmm. grab that it is. And I yeah. have people from the old guard and I won't name names, but bass players that, you know, that have that have said mean things to me or about me because they view me in in this certain way and i always i i have empathy for it because they mm-hmm. are struggling to figure out the new world the thing that they yeah. did with their band or the record label or whatever isn't working anymore they don't feel like they're a good presenter 
they don't uh, they don't maybe have a setup to record. They don't really even want to figure it out. They just want it to go back to the way it was, and it's never going back. It's not going to. It, is it isn't, and they they need they need to get over it. And I'm so glad you said it because I'm I'm I think I'm too polite sometimes, and I, I like to make excuses for people. But it, it it just purely is that they don't understand that changes are happening. Yes. And I'm on my own journey. I think this is what frustrates me sometimes about the music industry and social media as well is that people can get so possessive over certain things and think that things need to be done a certain way. Right. And it's so silly because if we were all more celebra- celebratory about what makes us successful as individuals, it'd be s- s- so much more of a much better place. Yes. Like it, it just, it really frustrates me that people are looked down on because they're taking a different path than someone else or you know, they haven't been gigging every Saturday and Sunday and they haven't been professionally trained. And it's the, that's one person's path and another person's path looks like this. And their success doesn't take away from yours. Like, there's nothing to be annoyed about. There's, there's nothing to hate on. It, it, Do your own thing. That's so true. It, it, you're right. It's abundant. There are, there are like mm. infinite lanes Right. And it's like you're in this lane. Someone else is in this lane. This person over here is in, you know, and it's all just part of it. Um, But it's just about confidence when people see you and they write mean things to you. You I know, you know, this I can tell because you're a self-aware person. And but I I mean, I just want to say it to you, too. It is just because they feel the, the lack of progress in their own yeah. world. And something I, I really wanted to tell you this. I'm it's so fun to talk to you. I wanted to tell you this today because <laughs> you? like you, I love when you make those videos where you mm-hmm. will mess up and you'll go yeah. back and you'll swear. And you're, I, and, and by the way, I don't know if, I don't know if you're swearing on this podcast. So, so I'm, so, so we I don't can know. swear. Okay. Hey, when, <laughs> when you fuck up, right. I love when you do that and you show that yeah. process and it's funny and it's so endearing. I mean, like I was checking you out and I was watching your videos and I was seeing your progression and like, Oh man, like, and I could see how much you're working on it. I'm like getting mm-hmm. like killing it. I mean, you're putting in the time. And then when you uploaded one of those videos of like totally messing something up and I yeah. was like, she is so rad because that actually <laughs> takes a lot of humility, a lot of confidence yeah. to show that. So I wanted to mm-hmm. ask you like what spurred you on to want to show that vulnerable side of you? I think it just comes back to my really disliking of not just in the music industry and not just social media, but uh, this need to be perfect. I feel like it's so fake and so just doesn't exist. And everything in me really dislikes and you see it play out in life in general as well. When we're talking about friendships and relationships that like on social media, the version of reality is so incredibly different. (laughs) And it's so frustrating for me to see these friendships and relationships. And I'm like, what you're posting online is so far from yes, the truth. Yes. And it frustrates me to no end because I'm like, it's not perfect. We're not perfect. Right. The world would be such a, a great place if everybody just sat down and acknowledged that like everybody has weaknesses and that sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we fuck up. Yes. <laughs> and yes. It's fine. Right. It's completely fine. Right. I think everything in me, like I say, that's just been something that I've had a deep disliking for mm-hmm. about the way that the world works. So if I can make someone feel a little bit more comforted by the fact that they're not alone, that they're messing up all the time, maybe yes. you're having a bad day. I want to do it. You know, I do get comments from time to time, people telling me to practice more. And I'm like, yeah, sure. I will. I do behind the scenes, but these videos actually, you know, help people. And even if it just helps just one, I've done something. And, and to me, when you're, you're sitting there with your instrument in front of that camera, working on, working on recording, that's practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are actually, what I see is that you, you are doing the work you're putting in the time you're learning so many songs and I can tell that you love it. And I can tell that you're striving. And so it's mm-hmm. like, I want to be like, bro, you go practice more. Like I'm, <laughs> I actually like, I feel like you could be like, hold up. 
I just uploaded a video of me practicing. <laughs> like, when is I, your last practice video? That's like what you want to say in your is, mind, right? This is the thing. Yeah. I think a lot of people have it in their heads as well that practice looks a certain type of way. Um, practicing scales and doing all of that is all great and necessary. But you can have fun while you practice, you know? Yeah. Like, I can play a song that I like and still call it practicing. 100%. <laughs> Just because I'm not like sat there doing scales in front of your face doesn't mean I don't do it behind the scenes. Well, and think <laughs> about all the things you're getting better at when you endeavor to mm. record yourself. You're criticizing, you're in real time, you're you're hitting that space bar going, nope, nope, because it's not good <laughs> enough. I mean, you're like, you're like sculpting, you know, like yeah. you're working on your time. You, ah, you miss that half step ah, or it doesn't quite feel right. And I can tell you're really perceptive to that because you'll be like, nah, not, you know, and it's, it's not good enough. And that's, mm-hmm. that's like sharpening your thing. It, and if you were and another way, sure. Is like running all the modes or whatever, but It doesn't matter. It like what matters, I think, is doing the things that you love and that bring you joy around music. And you'll get a gig in your future. You will. You will get an opportunity that will terrify you because there will be some level of vocabulary that you haven't worked on yet. And you'll have to dive in. And then it will give you a reason to dive into that stuff. That happens with everybody, right? Where you get an opportunity and it feels scary, but then that's what Mm -hmm. sharpens you. And right now you're sharpening in all of that, like in the recording world. Let me ask you this. Have you been asked to play on stuff as a result of these videos? Have you played on people's records? Have you done tracks for people? What's that look like for you? So I have been asked, I've never, the the thing is, I'm like, what do I charge? All of that was clueless to me. And because at at the time I was, and at the time and now I'm working on so many different things. I'm like, okay, I've got my Patreon and now I want to work on a podcast. And, but yeah, people, people do ask me and they have in the past, but I was like, that's another thing. I don't want to undersell or oversell. Mm. So I was like, I don't know where to start with this. And I didn't really, well, I could have asked someone, but I didn't at the time feel like I had anybody to ask for advice when it comes to that so I haven't yet I mean it's something I'd be down for doing um but yeah I need to I need to figure out logistically the charges and can can (laughs) I can I just give you a brief synopsis of what this looks like in my world because of course you can okay so check this out (laughs) I think I'm trying to be I'm trying to be cautious. I don't, not cautious. I just want to, okay, here's, here's the thing for me. When I was young, I mm-hmm. thought that professional meant money or I thought that it meant like yeah. I need to charge X amount for, for my services. And in some ways it does it. Of course you don't want to undersell, but also mm-hmm. in the beginning you do just need reps. Like you just need to yeah. do it. And so here's what I would say. I squandered opportunities in the beginning because I was like, well, I would love to play on your record, but I charge, you know, $500 <laughs> per and people would be like, oh, and it was a local thing. And, and I remember just, I did it with gigs too. Well, how much does the rehearsal pay? And, yeah, and I squandered those opportunities. Now that said, I wasn't in your position of having things that you were interested in doing in other avenues. I was not having yeah. to prioritize my time. So you have mm-hmm. this incredible thing right now where you you could be as busy as you want to be. Um, so you need to weigh like what what gets your yes, right? Yeah. But the thing that changed it for me is I watched an interview with Justin Meldel Johnson, who played who he played for Beck, for Paramore. He played he produced a producer now, M83, Tegan and mm-hmm. Sarah, I'm a robot, Macy Gray, Tori Amos. And he said, he said, here's the thing. The money to me is the least valuable thing that I'm going to get from the interaction. He's like, yeah. So he's like, because I'm making money in other ways or whatever. Right. Um, he said, for me, if it's cool, I do it. Mm. And that just meant if he is excited, you know, that feeling it's like, yeah, you get the like adrenaline blast. (gasps) If that feeling hits him, he says, yes. And that's his North star. And I thought, huh, I wonder if I could, I wonder if I could start to operate that way and what that would look like for me. And 
And I have to say it changed everything. Like when I started to like, not think about what am I going to charge? How am I going to appear professional? But once I started to go, Oh, this is dope. This I Mm -hmm. want, I want, I can envision what I would play. I'm excited to make content around this. I mean, I guess before, before content, I wasn't thinking about that, but when I could see (laughs) myself like, Oh, I'm excited. It's cool. I want to see, I'm envisioning myself on stage. I know what pedal I would, I know what bass I would choose. That's because who are, who are we without a great song? Mm. We're nothing. Yeah. It's so true. (laughs) Right. So it's so true. Yeah. So I feel like if it's cool, I do it. And I still do. In fact, I just had a call with this amazing artist. His name is, this sounds like a joke, but he's in LA. His (laughs) name is Ian Everson. (laughs) It's just, it's it's so weird. And I'm like, well, we have to work together because our names are so close. Yeah. But he sent me some stuff and right. Like, his budget is lower than maybe I would like, but it's so Mm -hmm. good that I'm like, dude, 100%. I view it as like an honor. If someone asked me to play on it, I'm like, I'm so thrilled that you want me to. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm pumped. Here's what I charge. And so the nitty gritty, I always say to artists, here's what I charge, but I don't care. Like here's the number I get. Or I, or I like to get, but also mm-hmm. I'll do it for half of that or, or whatever. Yeah. Or, or, and I find that with that upfront honesty, no one is trying to like screw me over or no one's like, Oh, sick. No. Then, you know, I'll pay you 25 bucks. It's like, people will, if people are asking you, they want to honor what you want. And then I think you say a number that you, that feels worth your time. But then yeah. also say, if you love it, say, but I love it. And bottom line is I want to make cool shit. Yeah. And then. That's really cool. Yeah, and that for me has worked really well over the years. Yeah, I'm definitely, I'm going to take, take that one with yes. me. Obviously I'm <laughs> still so, so new in the whole career just in general. Yeah. Cause I finished university back in July. So this is my first attempt at any kind of career, so let cool. alone being, being new to, you know, a music career. Yeah. But that's, that's really great advice that I am. Um, I'm going to take with me because I can 100% see how that would do great for me and the people I'm working with. Yes. No, I love that. And it just builds, it just builds relational capital too. It builds trust. It built, you know, if you are like happy to do it for lower than your rate, the artist feels like, Oh, they might actually like my stuff because can I tell you what is so vulnerable as an artist is saying, will you play on the, on the thing that I love the most? Like, will you contribute yeah. <laughs> to the thing that I love the most? Here it is. Uh, yeah. Like it's very vulnerable. Cause some people say, it is. Nope. Like, I don't like it. It's not enough money. It's this, it's that. Right. And the artist goes, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> you know? so sad. I never want to be that person. Well, no, I'm not saying. And, and also <laughs> you have to guard your time. Of course. But, yeah. but I think that like, it's controversial. I've talked about this in podcasts before where I've said the money is the least important thing. And people are always like, bro, you know, but you got to pay bills and oh, it sounds like a kid mm. with money. And I'm like, man, oh. I did not come up with money. But um, I just think that if, if there's a way that you can play on music and establish yourself as someone that does that, it's worth yeah. all the things that you get from that are worth more than the, the hundred dollars, the 150, the 200 quid, like Mm -hmm. way more. It's worth way more than the money that exchanges in, you know, Venmo or you guys don't have Venmo. I don't know. PayPal. What do you have over there? I don't think we have PayPal. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) That, you, well, I'm pretty like, sure that's what like I when use. your friend needs to send you money, like you guys go out and you get drinks and food or whatever. Your friend <laughs> needs to send you money because you paid for it. What do they use? Normally we just um, do bank transfer. Like we'll take our Ooh, yeah. certain card details and it'll go straight to the bank. But PayPal is definitely one that I use here. I use that for some work stuff, work related stuff. Got it. But not Venmo. Yeah, there's I think Venmo that exists here, but I just don't think. Does it, does it not well, exist I, at all? I tried way? to, I was going to pay someone Venmo and someone said they don't have it. They don't have it in Canada either. I just assumed it was everywhere. Oh. Typical American making assumptions. 
<laughs> Everyone's life is like mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like, <laughs> come on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about pedals now because I will be 100% transparent. That's not something I have any knowledge about sure. really. And it's, inc- it's incredible to me because bass playing in itself is incredibly difficult mm. coming from somebody who plays bass. But having the knowledge and knowing about pedals and using them will use your um, Taylor, most recent video, Taylor Swift antihero video, yeah. where you replicated the sound of the synth. Yeah. I was watching that video pretty much with my jaw wide open like, <laughs> How? How how do you get to a point where you so know yes. that I need this pedal and that pedal right. and uh, how? <laughs> you know, I think it's so funny because I have just always been interested in sounds. I'm like, I'm looking around for a pedal mm-hmm. right now. I've just always been interested in sounds. And it, it started as a kid without the internet, just wondering things like, God, I want mm. hearing Tony Levin on a Peter Gabriel record or hearing a bassist that I loved and going, what is that? And then I would just ask people and you know, like I'm old. So I've had all these years of wondering. And then when the internet came around, are you kidding me? Then I feel like I could see people do it. And I was so excited, but, but it really did come from a pure place of, I just really like sounds. I think Mm -hmm. the sound of a bass is almost more important to me in a way than, than like all of the notes, like, you know, yeah. I love great bass lines. Don't get me wrong. Like I love when it's funky and, but I also love when a bass line is like, boom, and just like mm-hmm. where it, it almost sounds like a soundtrack or it's evoking a feeling. I think that's what I yeah. love about synth bass is that it's sort of this odd parallel universe to the electric bass. It does the same function. It's still bass, but it's like, all about sound, you know? Yeah. And that's cool to me. It always has been. I love hip hop music and electronic music. And so, Mm -hmm. and basses in those worlds always sound different. So I found first, I found an octave pedal and that was the very first thing, which just takes your note, you know, and plays it an octave lower than you play it. So it immediately, wow, it shifts your whole perspective because you have to play an octave higher than you would to generate Mm -hmm. that same pitch. And oh, and it's interesting up here on the bass. It sounds kind of like it's just a different timbre and the octave is so low. You kick that on and in a band context, everybody's like, oh, because the floor just feels like it (laughs) drops a couple feet. And you're like, oh, this is so (laughs) sick. And then for me, it was like, well, what do you after that? What is there? Oh, you can put a fuzz after that. Oh, and that's going to make it like, like so meaner. Oh, and after that, you know, a synth has these oscillators, like a typical Moog synthesizer or something, or, a, or an ARP or an Oberheim has essentially two mm-hmm. pitches, like two oscillators where, you know, one can be slightly detuned from the other one. So the two notes aren't quite playing in sync. And that's what gives it the sort of like seasickness or kind of the warble. And that's what chorus does. So, you know, like in the beginning for me, it was like, whoa, if you do octave, fuzz, chorus, <laughs> you sort of sound like a synthesizer. You got it going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and that to me was just a sound that I loved. And, mm-hmm. and I've said this before, so sorry if I'm, you know, if you've heard me say this or if anyone's listening to this, heard me say this. For the longest time, I didn't, I thought it was lame that I did it that way. Mm -hmm. Like I, I always was like, Oh, I should play a real keyboard or, Oh, you should hire, I would downplay it. Oh, you should hire someone that can really do it. Yeah. And then I had my dear friend, Jonathan Marin, who's a great bass player. Layla, do you know Jonathan Marin? I don't think I do. Maybe I'll know his face, but I don't know He's if I know particularly by name. He's an incredible player. And he plays in, in New I'll, York. I'll have to research. Played in a band, founded a band called The Groove Collective. He is a beast. And he was interested in pedals and stuff early. And mm-hmm. he said something to me of like, and it, it's created this mantra for me. He said, the thing that you're embarrassed about, the thing that you like, right? You like it about your playing, mm-hmm. but you're embarrassed if other people will like it. You're like, you're not sure, or you like that band or that genre, but it's not cool. You know, it's like, yeah. you don't want to say it because you don't want to feel, um, he said, that is your shit. Like whatever yeah. that feeling is inside of you, that's your voice. And so I translate it as like your vulnerability, the thing that you're like, uh, like, I don't know, mm-hmm. that's actually who you are. 
So yeah, I just that was decided, that was something actually. Yeah. I was gonna I was gonna talk about was yeah. that vulnerability is your voice, and it's it's so cool because now you've created like an Ian niche. Like if I was to think of Ian, it is pedals and effects and everything. Like that was it's, it's cool to hear you say that it was one thing that you were a little bit vulnerable about at, totally, at one point. Yes. Yeah, and now it's become oh. Ian. Ian's so separate from everybody else because mm. you know when you're watching Ian's content. Mm. And I, I completely get what you mean when you say your vulnerability is your voice because that's that's how you're going to be authentically you and set yourself apart from everybody else. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it, for me, it was really scary though. I've got to say mm. like, and it wasn't until I had like sort of a midlife crisis around 40. I mean, God, it's... I turned 40 and I was finally like, <laughs> all right. Like I had a decade of being in like a band. I was like a kid in a band. And then mm. I had a decade of side musician stuff. And then now I'm 40. Okay. And so this is four years ago. And I was like, well, now what? And I, I need something I can control. I would like to build some kind of brand. Is it too late? I'm old. And then I was like, <laughs> what if I just decide, what if I make a mental shift that the stuff I'm doing is cool because yeah. actually I sort of thought it was like I was playing. I mean, all through my thirties, I was doing this stuff. I just wasn't talking about it. And mm -hmm. I was thinking, Oh, you know, there's other players that do it so much better and in cooler music and in jazz, there's all these players that make like weird, yeah. crazy sounds in jazz. And I'm like, and I don't, I don't really like jazz. So, you know, or like, <laughs> I don't feel it in my heart. Like I feel yeah, I pop music. Like it's funny. I 100% get what really? you mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and like people are like, Oh, Taylor Swift. I'm sure you just did that for the content grab. And I'm like, well, no, I love that record. <laughs> like, like Taylor I Swift love lover. It. Yeah. I There's love nothing it. wrong with liking Taylor no, Swift. No, there isn't. She's incredible. And yeah. And I just, so for me, it was doubling down on what I actually liked and really not caring about what anybody thought. And then as a result, that's the thing that, you know, made people, made people care and made people like, my perspective. I thought, oh, everybody's going to think I'm lame because I'm going to admit that I like Taylor Swift. No. And it, it couldn't have been farther. Ah, I, I got a few snarky, jazzy, indie rock friends that, that are a little... You would do. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> most people are like, oh, cool. You like those things. Great. And I had sort of built this monster in my mind. Like, oh, people are going to be so judgmental and harsh and Mm -hmm. you know, and mean, and they're going to think so easy stupid. to do. Yeah. yeah. And everybody was like, cool, man, like what you like. <laughs> you know, like yeah. You, it's cause you were challenging these like notions of, you know, you have to love jazz and you yes. have to, you know, the, these are the genres that you need to, you need to focus on. Yes. And pop for some reason is one of those, those genres that people are a bit like, you're, you're, you're a musician and you're, you're playing pop pops, like the one that you look a little bit down on. Yes. I think it's really cool that you're, you're challenging these type of things and your audience. I love the fact that when you talk about encouraging people to create their own sound, you're also telling them challenge rules because there's a lot of rules out there that are just there to be there yeah. that have no real foundation True. and you challenging these rules then means that you, you step out of this box that you've been put in yes. from, I mean, some rules are rules that you listen to. Like if you, if you're hurting yourself with the wrong technique, of course, that's a problem. Yes. yes. But like other things, like you say, playing with a pick and right. I, all of those, like it, it's, I just love the fact that you, and this is a, another reason why I really love that you're on this podcast is because I kind of want my podcast to share the same message of mm. we're all musicians. We all do things the way that we want to do yes. them. And that's completely fine. Yes, it is. And there's nothing wrong with challenging a rule from every now and then. And I love that. I love that you do that. Thank you. I mean, and I, I think it's so valuable to have a podcast like mm -hmm. this, to tell people this message, because it took me a yeah. long time to actually internalize this message. And I think now there's probably a little less stigma than when I came up around playing with a pick, playing different techniques, yeah. playing pedals, playing, but I came up in this real stodgy time, or at least in my town and in the people that I knew were kind of like, Oh, if you want to be legit, here are the rules. Here are all the things mm. you have to do. And, and I make a differentiation between best practices, right? There, of course, 
technique, of course, putting your finger in the right place, of course, learning a wide range of styles, learning theory, knowing how to play scales and arpeggios and knowing what that stuff is will help. But it doesn't, Mm -hmm. it's not a gateway. It's not, um, if, even if you can't play arpeggios and scales, but you're making cool sounds and you're making music that's compelling. Great. Like it's fine. And so like, there are these sort of elitist voices out there that will say, you know, (laughs) you know, in order to get to this, you have to climb this ladder and don't slow anything down. And you have to, you know, you have to do it this way and you have to transcribe these solos. And to that, I say only if you want to, (laughs) Yeah, because it's abundant. It's abundant. It's, it's honestly so refreshing to hear you say it. And I think that's that's another reason why you are one of my favourite people just mm. on Instagram. And just you, I, it's so refreshing because I've not come across many people who so outwardly think like mm. you, if that makes sense. Mm. I'm sure there's people that share the same point of view, but I, I really appreciate that you're so outward with it and are encouraging of other people and aren't scared to say you know what, actually, I don't agree with this rule and that rule. Just have fun and do your thing. I'm not here to judge. That's what I love. You're not judgmental in the slightest. And you're here for everyone. Like, I'll read your Instagram comments (laughs) the way you reply to people on your Instagram comments. And it's Hmm. it's so incredibly non-judgmental. And you you take genuine interest in your followers. Hmm. And that in itself is so refreshing Hmm. because social media has now become, I want to build my numbers and I want to have a fan base. Yes. Of course. And these people are here to just watch me do my thing. But with you, it's so different because you you take active interest in people and make them feel appreciated. appreciated. Yes. And I just I just love oh, that. I think you. I think we all should we all should be more like that. I'm going to I take I try to take parts of that as well and <laughs> yeah. translate it into my Instagram because well, I, I don't yeah. I don't want people to think that, you know, I don't care about them. Of course. I do. It's. I think for me, um, it's just another Scott actually described it once and it blew my mind as a, as a, Mm -hmm. as a physical location. He, he calls it the digital city. So just like Mm -hmm. London or just like Nashville or just like Los Angeles, Instagram is Instagram, the digital city. And so if, if I think about it that way, I want to have interactions online in a similar manner that I would have them in a physical location. So if someone came up to me on the street and said, Hey man, I like that thing that you do. I wouldn't do this. You know what I'm yeah, saying? You wouldn't. Like I wouldn't no. turn around for those of you not watching the video. Like, like I just turned <laughs> around in my chair. I think that's what a lot of us do online is we, we do, we just walk away. Did you, like we, we see the comment. We all see them because we're addicted mm-hmm. to them. Right. But then we, <laughs> we, we think that it's cooler to not acknowledge. Yes. And I get it. Oh, I mean, goodness. I see, you know, like people are be like, Oh, Ian, he's so thirsty. Like, you know, I see, responding to every single comment. But really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to just acknowledge the comment like I would do it on the street. I would say, Mm -hmm. thank you. I'd say, hey, cheers. I'd say, oh, sometimes I go in and take a look at what they do and be like, hey, you do. Yeah. This thing that you're doing looks sick. So because that's what a human being does. It is. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It is. And it's so incredibly down to earth. And I remember the first time I actually interacted with a piece of content of yours and you did the exact same thing Mm. to me. You know, I I left a comment and you were like, Layla means a lot. Like, you're great. And I was like, whoa, like (laughs) a little comments like that go such a long way Mm. that like whether you realize it or not, you're positively contributing to this person Mm whether you've made their day or whether you've made them feel a little bit better. Maybe they were going through a hard time and actually thought, maybe I'm not good enough to do this. Maybe I need to go and do something else. And a comment from you has then made them think, Mm. actually, I've got something going here. Oh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. In coming from that, though, I do want to ask you, has there ever been a moment when you were like, I don't think I'm good enough for this or (sighs) I don't think I want to do this? Has there been a moment? We can call it imposter syndrome. We can call it... So, I don't think this so is for me. many times mm. I have it, I have it 
to this day. I'm, you know, I'm about to go on and do like a, like a live Q and a thing for the mm-hmm. slap bass accelerator on, on yeah. SBL. And SBL. I'm like, uh, will someone have me, you know, is someone going to want me to demonstrate something and I won't be able to, and I'll feel silly. I mean, I, oh, goodness, yeah. I struggle with that stuff all the time. My favorite imposter syndrome story is when I was right before COVID, I was out with Eric Hutchinson playing gigs as, mm-hmm. in a trio configuration. And before the tour, he said to me, he plays guitar and keys, but like a, in accompaniment mode. So he's not a, like a, like a shredder or he, he's not playing a guitar solo. He's not playing a key yeah. solo. He accompanies himself, singer, songwriter, killer writer, killer singer. And then instrumentally he, he's like an accompanist, right? Yeah. So he said yeah. to me, will you just take all of the solos on the bass? I was like, what? He's like, all oh. the solos, could you just figure them out on the bass? <laughs> I oh was my like, goodness. Maybe. And then I did. And it was really fun. Um, but I had huge imposter syndrome around that. Mm-hmm. Like, oh my God. So I'm on a wireless. I'm stepping out to the edge of the stage, putting on a big fuzz, tearing into a solo. That's not a typical bass player move. So I was feeling at the beginning of that tour um, insecure about that. But yeah. it was all it was fun. And when I wasn't in my head, it was fun. But one night we played in L.A. at the Troubadour and Steve Jenkins came to the gig. Do you know Steve Jenkins? He's a Los Angeles Again. bass player. He is has played with some of my heroes. He's ferocious, like a technician. And I will <laughs> never forget. He DM me and said, I'm coming to the show. And I was like, oh, wow. And oh, my goodness. And then I thought two things. I thought I was really excited and um, humbled. And then I was terrified Mm. because I really respect him. And then I was like, I'm going to be in my head the whole night. And we walked down the stairs and I was looking around in the crowd and I was like, Oh, he's not here. Good. And then I saw him and I was like, no, (laughs) you know, and I played the gig and it was fine. But I was thinking about every move I made. I was just in my head about every single thing, whatever the gig went fine. And afterwards, we, I saw him and I was like, dude, I have to say two things. Thank you for coming and fuck you for coming. <laughs> he was like, what? He was like, why? And I'm like, dude, you're Steve Jenkins. I was in my head the whole time. I was like, and he was oh like, oh, goodness. and then he said a thing, Layla, that I will never forget. He goes, dude, no. He's like, it's, it's lanes. It's superheroes. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you're he's like Marvel. And I was like, sure. And he's like, okay, you are Wolverine. <laughs> And I'm Thor. He's like, you're not mad that I have the hammer and I'm not mad that you have the claws. He's like, think about it. Like superheroes all have a thing that they do and they have a tragic backstory and they're probably insecure and they're, they're a mess, but they're not pining away for the other person's power ever. No, like you never hear in those stories how like, oh, Batman. Oh, if only, you know, like Superman, (laughs) if only I could. It's never that they're they're on their their own path with their own struggles and their own powers. And I thought that's pretty hip. And I said to him, Steve Jenkins, like, are you calling me a superhero of the base? And he was like, yeah, man, of course. Yeah. I gave him a big hug. He definitely did call you that. Yeah. And that's the thing that I try to impart to people like. You don't have to have all the bebop vocabulary under your belt. You don't have to know Mm -hmm. all of the scales to melodic and harmonic minor. Like you, modes rather, you just need to make music that you like, that makes you feel good and invincible and amazing. And if that's really simple music or really complicated music, you'll figure out the things you need to make that music. But it's not about the mountain of vocabulary that you know necessarily. Yeah. It is if you want to play bebop, but if you just <laughs> want to make music that you love that requires a certain thing, find that thing and do it. And do it mm-hmm. and do it and do it. And like you'll find that you'll build a certain voice and a certain set of skills that will bring you all all over the place, all over the world, hopefully like it's done for me. Yeah. And so, yeah, Yeah. I, I'm a real champion of that. Now, I mean, you do have to play, you do have to know some things and, you know, best practices and all that. It's not to say like, you can just pick it up and bang on it and whatever, but yeah, yeah, follow the things that you love. It's, it's the, it's for sure. My North star for sure. 
Yeah, no, hearing you say that has helped me a lot because it's, it's, it's easy to forget that, you know, everyone else is a normal person and experiences things as well. I've talked exactly. to a few people in the past who have also said, like, imposter syndrome, of course, like, of course I deal with that. Yeah. It's just something that, that I push through and I know that's going to be there, but I'm going to keep doing me and doing the things I'm doing and have faith that I'm, I'm going to get where I'm supposed to be. And yes. I think a lot of people watching and hearing this is going to really appreciate um you being so open about oh. having those experiences and I think about it every day and yeah. and I think that if you don't there's something wrong with you I think that if you don't have at least a little bit of imposter syndrome what does that mean it means you're probably a narcissist or, yes. or a sociopath you're so I right mean, Yes. Like actually a little bit of imposter syndrome is very human and very healthy yeah. to think and it actually helps you strive. So, so for really me, does. I, I, I want to embrace it. I want to, and I want to acknowledge it when I'm feeling it. I want to say to myself, like, I'm feeling this, I'm feeling that I'm not good enough. I know that I am, but mm -hmm. what do I need to do? What do I need to work on? How do I need to prepare in order to, to alleviate some of this anxiety? And sometimes yeah. it's just like working on the music a little more. Or, you know, getting getting prepared for the thing that I'm about to do, because if I feel prepared, whether that's with gear or with, you know, I've worked on the music a lot, that yeah. really helps me actually alleviate imposter syndrome. Yeah, I'm the same. Yeah. 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 Because you can't go from I can't do this to believing that you're a superhero. The, the thing about the superhero analogy that doesn't work is that if mm -hmm. you don't believe that you are one. <laughs> right. Like if yeah. you're like. Oh, I hear what you're saying, Ian, but I'm not a superhero. Well, then then the whole analogy falls. So yeah. then it's like, what do you have to do to believe it? How do you have to prepare? What do you have to work on? You have to work hard, you know? You do. And so that's, I think sometimes misconstrue what I say is like, whatever, just be you. Pick up the bass when you feel like it. You'll be great. It's fine. But I mean, <laughs> it's a I'm shit so ton of work, as you know. It is. Yeah. It is, yeah. No, I, I, I really appreciate that. And people listening and watching too, uh, I think that's, that's something that they needed to hear. And mm. the whole narcissistic thing, you've like completely switched a thing in my head. Mm. I'm like, well, if I, if I, if I wasn't feeling like an imposter, then that's a worry. I, I, you've exactly. transformed the way I think about that now. So that's really cool. Yeah. It would be like, you're delusional. Like if you yeah. didn't have something of like, Ooh, like if you were like 20, you, you, are you 21? Did you say that you're 21? That's insane. Yeah, I'm 21. It's amazing. Like if you were like, <laughs> I'm 21 and I'm the greatest, people would be like, well, you know what I mean? Like you have to have, yeah. you it's have to egos. go through stuff. Yeah, for sure. They're and, not welcome here. <laughs> right? And that would take you to a very different place. You know, it would take you to a place, but it would be very different, right? Than what you're yeah. cultivating for yourself now. So I think, yeah, as long as I, I hope that imposter syndrome for you, for me, for everyone listening is actually a mm -hmm. motivator, a motivator to get yeah. the work done versus a crippler. Like I don't want uh, imposter syndrome for anybody to be like, well, now I just can't function. You don't want that. Like you want to no. rise above it so that you can say, well, what do I need to do to alleviate some of this anxiety? Yeah. Yeah. What do you do it to alleviate strength. the anxiety? Um, oh, it's really, it, it's a hard, it's, it's hard to say because I'm naturally outside of music and everything else. Anxiety has been something that I've struggled with mm. for a long time. Mm. So I've got the combination of being a naturally anxious person mm. in the combination with imposter syndrome in the music industry and with my bass playing and everything else. But it takes a lot of mental effort for me to bring myself back to earth and say, look, if I don't go through with this, I might not get to the point in my career that I want to get to. Right. I could be missing out on so many incredible things because I've let this imposter syndrome stop me from doing the podcast. Yes. Stop me from going to that gig. Stop me from, you know, meeting up with someone that, you know, I've I've met online but has incredible amounts of information that that that, that they can give me sure. like the the whole impost, imposter syndrome thing really when I think about it and I bring myself down a peg yes. and I'm like, Layla, this is, this really isn't going to help you. If I get too carried away with, I don't think I'm good enough. 
I'm never I'm never going to get to where I want to be. So it's it's just a lot of mental effort to remind myself that you have goals and to achieve them and to be the best person that you want to be. Yeah. You're going to have to constantly challenge those thoughts. Right. Yeah. It's I, I love that. And that and even if it's scary or even if you fail mm-hmm. or you don't get the gig yeah. or you whatever like That will, that is actually forward momentum. That's forward motion. We put so much, or I remember in my twenties, I put so much weight on every decision. And I wish that I would have just Mm. seen that it was bigger, that even if, you know, like I got fired from a session and I thought, oh, well, I was 26. I'm like, well, that's it. It's over. I'm done. Oh, damn. And it was actually the beginning. It was the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like someone saying, it was someone saying, you need to bring in a different set of music into your repertoire. I didn't know anything about the Beatles or Jamerson or Motown yeah. or, you know, and I, I got fired because they wanted to do kind of like a Motown early Beatles, Paul McCartney thing. And I couldn't do it. And, and oh. the producer said, well, let's be done. <laughs> I'll never forget. It. <laughs> and then he said, oh go to the record store and buy <laughs> Beatles number ones and like Hitsville USA, the Motown box set. And then work on that music. And then when you feel confident with it, call me back. And I said, Dumb. Oh, okay. And he said, so, you know, bye. Kind of. Yeah. And I packed up my stuff and I got in my car and I wept. I wept. Oh my goodness. And then I went and bought the records and then I yeah. did the work. See, this is why you can't have a big ego. Yeah. Cause if you were someone who had a big ego, you'd say, Ah, oh, the world is against me, and exactly. I'm, maybe I'm not supposed to do this. Yes. And you you pushed all those thoughts aside, and you said, "Well, this is just something that I need to pick up." Like <laughs> yeah. you have your moment. I definitely would have cried 100 <laughs> yeah. percent after experiencing that. Yes. But it's one of those things you just have to brush it off and be like, "Okay, that's the reality of the situation." Now I'm going to go and listen to these records. Exactly, and it felt horrible in real time, yeah. but mm. oh, it it changed my life actually for the better. And you're absolutely right. There was part of me that thought that wanted to be like, oh, well, fuck that guy. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. What does he know? Yeah. But I knew actually deep down, I knew that he was right. I knew that he was right. And I was mm. flossing. I was pretending he would be like, let's do this thing. But McCartney and I would be like, kind of like this. I didn't know what I was doing. And he was like, <laughs> mm, not like that. And I was like, oh, and then I just that the heat rising. <laughs> you know oh, I mean? just like, yeah. But it really was good for me because it expanded my mind into so many other things. And, you know, uh, yeah. So I think that like the journey is a big, it, it's the best teacher. And that sounds like, yeah. it sounds like something you'd see on a wall. So cheesy, like the journey is the best teacher, <laughs> like a best whale like, coming out of the ocean. Um, but, but really like the failure is a gift. It, and that's, that's it another is. stupid saying, but it's so true. <laughs> it's really true that when you fall on. on your butt, like it will, it, it will, as long as you have the faculties to get up again and go, mm-hmm. like it will yeah. change your life for the better. It really will. 100% and you've I mean I, I kind of had that thinking before but talking to you today on this podcast has really like solidified everything that like yeah you can fail that's totally. completely yes. fine yes and, and I love should. it should and like if you're not yeah. then if you're not failing like you you're just in such a weird comfort zone I mean that's what like mm-hmm. going back to the stuff that you post where you're working on stuff and you're going like shit like, and going through that, Fuck. that process. Yes. Like, I love <laughs> that because you're demonstrating like a bunch of micro failures and that yeah. those failures are carving you. They're carving you. They're like, you are like sharpening your tools during that process. And it is a result of failure. And that's so mm-hmm. awesome. Like you're doing such a great service by showing that process. You really are because thank you. I, I, Seriously, Layla, when I see that stuff, I wonder, am I self-confident enough to make a video like that? Like, I wonder that. I'm like, do I have the confidence to do that thing? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know that I do, but I probably should. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's so weird because I've had people say this exact same thing Mm. to me. But in my head, I'm like, failing is so normal and natural. Like, (laughs) that's great. You know, why why don't we show it? But and then I have to 
bring myself back to earth again and say like not everybody thinks like you Layla mm. that's really really hard for some people yeah. a really vulnerable thing right. for some people for to sure do. for sure I mean if you're uh, Ian I'd love to see your behind the scenes <laughs> videos of you if you ever wanted to I, need to do I think it. it'd be great I need to do it I think it. you do yeah I'd love it. I'd love them. And I guarantee everybody else will mm-hmm. too. And you'll be contributing to the to the change, as cringe as that sounds, of, you know, failing is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It doesn't make you a bad musician. Of course. And yes. we all do it. We all there's, do it absolutely... over and over again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Continuously. Challenge accepted. In, in the next couple yes. of weeks, I, I will make a post where I'm just... And I will give you credit, credit where credit is due. I'm like, I'm ripping off Layla right now. I mean, you can if you want. (laughs) Yeah, you you don't have to, but if you want to, that's completely fine. Yeah. I'm just excited. I'm just excited (laughs) to see it. Amazing. Thank you for joining me today, oh, by the way. It's, my it's pleasure. been it's been really nice. So fun. Seeing as this is the first episode though, I kind of had an idea in my head. I wanted to make a link to like the name of the podcast and have the same last the same last question on all of my podcasts. Love it. So the last question is this um, this might be a little bit of an on the spot one, so I apologize I can't in wait. advance. But <laughs> If you were to choose one song to describe the way your career has gone so far, what would it be? So, AK, what is your soundtrack to success? Oh, that... It's a question. You it's a question. You are the worst for asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> you are the worst for asking... Oh, I thought you were going to be you like, didn't... if you had one base on a desert island and... oh. <laughs> The soundtrack for yeah. success. Yeah, if you had to describe your success. To be fair, you did this to yourself, Ian, because you didn't <laughs> want to see the questions. So <laughs> It's so true. <sighs> no, if you don't have one, it's completely fine. Oh, I had I a really... Have to, I, have to have, I have to have one, though. I can't just not answer that question. Wow. Well, yeah, what you do. You have to have big, <laughs> big question. So a song that exists... That's the soundtrack for my success. Or the way you see your success going, because you've still got a lot of life to live, Ian. It's not. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, that's the thing is like, I still, I still feel. You're still going. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, um, this is such a, can, this is a potentially a lame answer, but my mind keeps Sorry. hitting it. So I need to. I need to just tell you this. Like I could, like I was like, ch 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 changes. No, <laughs> not going to answer that. No, because I've had all these, you know, like bobs and weaves, but that's dumb. What my mind goes to is this thing that I haven't heard before that I would like to make. So I think my mm-hmm. answer to you is going to be a record that I want to make in the future that I hope is the soundtrack to some level of success. And here's what it is. Yeah. I'm from this, I'm from a part of the United States that is like more rural. It's Montana. I don't know if you've ever been yeah. or heard of it, but it's what's heard on it, my never hat. Been. <laughs> I'm from, I'm from a little tiny town called Kalispell. I guess it's not so little tiny, but it's pretty small up in the Northwest corner. Yeah. Country music. Um, oh, and, and I, hated it growing up. I didn't hate the place, but I hated country music and like old country music is like stupid. Like my parents liked it. I'm like, dumb, that sucks. And then I moved to the city. I moved to Minneapolis and got, you know, now I'm listening to cool music. I'm listening to hip hop and EDM and playing synth bass and pop. Yes. (laughs) And then I, at, you know, as I aged, I came to grips with my childhood and how I was born and raised and how I've never felt more Montanan than I feel Mm -hmm. now. And so I, I'm going to make a record that is going to combine the, the electronic production and the synthy sounds of pop music that I love with, I love that. Yeah. With top lines of like baritone guitar country, like that sort of, have you ever heard that like sort of spring reverb and tremolo sound that I use? Sometimes it's like, probably, yeah. It sounds kind of like um, country music, Glenn Campbell, Johnny Cash. Um, that, those sounds and melodies that are from the mountains, that are from my childhood, wow. that are from that, yeah. combined with the electronic elements of the pop music that I love. That to me, I've never heard it quite in, I've never heard this record. 
and I want mm-hmm. to hear this record. And so I think that I just need to make it. I need yes. to make this record. So that's... You know what? I think that's the best answer you could have just given me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, play, you outplayed the system. That's, I don't think <laughs> there was a better answer yeah. to you. <laughs> yeah, I gamed it. I gamed it. It's, yeah, it's, it, but it also is a little haughty. Like, well, it's something that doesn't yet exist. Like that's, <laughs> I'm going to make it. <laughs> yeah, but I do. I've had this thought for years, actually, of like combining these two genres, I guess, and making some... Um, hopefully like a compelling sound out of those two things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. And I can't wait for when you make it. And it is, sounds like a great soundtrack (laughs) to success. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you again, Ian, for taking the time to join me today. Oh, it's Um, my pleasure. I can't can't believe that this is the first episode I've done because it's just crazy. I've been a fan of you for such a long time and now we're sat here having a conversation. Well, likewise. And and can I tell you, I had a little bit of imposter syndrome when you announced the podcast. I was like, really? I wonder, like like in my, in my tiny mind, I wonder if she'd ask me. (laughs) You were like my dream guest, Ian, honestly. (laughs) Well, well, let me, let me just say you're doing, you're doing such great work, Layla. You are doing such great work. I love that you have a pod now. It's just the natural progression and you have so much in front of you. Like your future is so bright. I can tell that you you feel that deep down. There will be roadblocks and bumps and stuff along the way, but you're doing Mm -hmm. You are doing it right. And I just can't wait. Like I'm, I'm such a fan. So I'm going to no. be like in the sidelines, like, you know, and when you're massive and you're touring with the massive artist and I'll be like, I was, I was oh. the first, I'll be like, I was the first guest on her podcast. <laughs> yeah. This is Ian. We are living in an iconic moment. Yeah, yeah, this, exactly. this, this is it. <laughs> this is it. We're going to look back and be like, yeah. oh, I remember that episode. No, for real. Um, I just, you just need to know that I'm like, I'm your cheerleader. I'm your fan. Thank you. So same for you. Yeah. Cheers. I'm, I'm just, it's just weird to even hear you say that. It's so cool and weird that like, (laughs) yeah, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very glad that we've, we've had this chance to talk and, and connect. Same, same. It was awesome. And I can't wait. I'm going to listen too. I can't wait to hear what you're doing on the pod. So I'll be out there. A faithful listener. Yeah, I've got to figure out all the editing and stuff, which I'm sure I will. It's all good. You can figure um, it out. It, yeah, yeah, I'll figure it out. It might take a while, but it's completely fine. <laughs> it is, yeah. It is. It's yeah. part of it. It's part of the whole thing. It is. It definitely is. Well, thank you so much, Ian. You're so welcome. <laughs>